Boker Tov, Yashar Koach, to the Cantor, and thank you to the American Jewish Committee and all of you for being here and for your commitment to Israel and to the Jewish people. We're gathered here in this special place where the Beit HaMikdash once stood, where Jewish pilgrims came to offer their first fruits, where the Kohen Gadol offered blessings to the people and the most sacred prayers unto God. And any Jew, no matter where they live, no matter how she worships, no matter what he believes, is connected to this place. Our connections as rooted in the soil as the ancient olive trees that grow in it. Our bond cannot be severed, not by war or temporary separation or false claims or distorted history. And that common origin here, where Avraham Avinu and Sari Menu raised their family, which Moshe Rabbeinu viewed from across the Jordan, where David Amelech established his capital and Shlomo Amelech built Beit HaMikdash, that unites the Jewish people in a shared history and a common destiny. Jerusalem remains our beating heart. But this week's Parsha, Parshat Koach, offers a warning, a flashing light that we must not ignore. As Moshe struggles to lead B'nai Israel on their journey, he's confronted by a rebellion in their midst. Koach and his company seek to split the people, elevating themselves above others, declaring that Hashem has anointed them with special holiness. Hashem's response is unforgiving. Korach, Korach's attempt to split the people leads to tragedy, death, and plague. Now let's be clear about the lesson. We don't need to imagine the earth splitting open and swallowing some among us today. We don't need to label any Jew as Korach, a modern-day Korach, the instigator of division. We can draw a more basic conclusion and a warning, and that's this. Disunity among the Jewish people can lead to tragedy. And it has before. It happened in the time of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. Meters from here are the stones that fell on that fiery day. We can see the indentations they left in the earth when they fell. And these ancient stones, they call to us. Our sages teach us that the Beit HaMikdash fell, at least in part, because of sinat chinam, baseless hatred among the Jewish people. A further teaching associated with the Korach episode tells us that some controversies, some machlokot, lead to tragedy. Korach's treachery was such an example. He was self-aggrandizing. He sought to divide Am Yisrael. He promoted himself and pursued his agenda at the expense of the unity of the people. But there can also be a controversy for the sake of heaven. Machloket l'shem ha'shamayim a disagreement that elevates. Disagreements in the search for truth, like those between Hillel and Shammai, are l'shem ha'shamayim, for the sake of heaven. As Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs teaches, the sages are here drawing a fundamental distinction between two kinds of conflict, argument for the sake of truth and argument for the sake of victory. The search for truth calls us to embrace our diversity, to listen to each other, to learn from one another, to accept that each Jew, no matter how he prays, no matter where she affiliates, adds something precious to the story of our people. Now, no one here is a naive. We read the headlines. We've seen the survey results that challenge us, including those published this week by the American Jewish Committee. We can all add our own anecdotes. Israeli Jews and diaspora Jews, particularly those in North America, have different conceptions about what we mean to one another, different ideas about religious authority and its relationship to the state of Israel, as M.K. Azaria just told us, different ideas about peace and the land, and indeed, whether and how and when we should listen to each other at all. And I don't wish to exaggerate, but at times one can even detect the faintest echoes of Sinat Chinam. But we can do better. We must do better. Let those of us who live in the diaspora reinvigorate our commitment to Israel, 
and its security in the face of threats, of terror, of unconscionable calls for its destruction or challenges to its legitimacy. Let Israelis know that we have their back and that we celebrate Israel as the strong, secure, Jewish and democratic state it is and must always remain. Let those who live in Israel express with open minds and open hearts that Jews based in communities not in the Jewish homeland and the Jewish state are fully part of the Jewish people, deserving of respect and appreciation in all of their multifaceted streams of Jewish expression. Let's keep our commitments to one another. Standing here in the shadow of the Kotel, let's strive to make it a symbol of unity. Let us never, ever give up on the search for peace in this land, even when we think it's not possible, or at least not possible now. Let us ensure that Israel can defend itself. And let us never close that door, that door that keeps the dream alive of Israel and its neighbors living side by side in peace, security, and mutual recognition. Let, let us embrace the beauty and diversity of the Jewish people, those who have been here for generations and those who have just arrived or have never been and who we need to bring, those whose traditions and customs are as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore, wherever they live, in Yerushalayim and Tel Aviv or B'nai Brak or London or Kiev or India or Tehran or Detroit or Ethiopia or Tunisia, or Berlin, or Moscow, or Uganda. They are all our brothers. They are all our sisters. Let us recognize that machloket l'shem ha'shamayim, controversy for the sake of heaven, disagreements among Jews, I mean, after all, we're Jews, can be a source of learning that it is legitimate to disagree with, even criticize Israel when we feel so moved. As Israeli citizens, we had just heard a member of Knesset do so all the time. But that such critiques only have power when they come from a place of love, when they are coupled with attempts to help Israel with its challenges, when they find Israeli voices, those who do agree and those who differ, to engage with, and when they understand that Israelis and their government will make the decisions that only they are empowered to make. Let us never forget our values of compassion, mercy, caring for the weak, and loving the stranger. That kol Yisrael aravim zelazeh, all Jews are responsible for each other. We can find that unity. We can sustain it. We can nurture it. We can expand it. The future of the Jewish people, the future of the state of Israel, the future of the relationship between us, will be brighter when we do. Several years ago, I had the sad honor to attend the funeral of Rabbi David Hartman, Zichonor Livracha, at the Shalom Hartman Institute that he founded. Rabbi Hartman was a true tzaddik, a lifelong teacher and learner who added immensely to the intellectual and spiritual life of our people, of this city, and of this country. And in her, in her deeply moving eulogy at the funeral, his daughter, Tova Hartman, a great scholar and spiritual leader in her own right, described her father as possessing an unconditional love for the Jewish people. It's a beautiful phrase that has stuck with me. Unconditional love for the Jewish people. We can be hard to love. We are a stiff-necked people. We question and argue and question some more. But I think there is no better calling than to start with Rabbi Hartman's example. Express our unconditional love for our people, commit ourselves to strengthening our bonds and our values, and help lead Israel and the Jewish people to a future of unity, strength, and peace. Thank you. <laughs>